All right, so I'm giving this a try to see if this isn't a better way to, um, to do things here. This is my office studio, and this is where I do a lot of the kind of live uh, webinars and other things such as that. Um, and I got a great uh, email asking a couple questions about scleral buckling and other things such as that from Daniel Agarwal, who is a uh, fellow at Yale University. And I always love getting questions from people about different things. Normally I'll, I'll type things back, but I just thought this may be a different kind of venue. Uh, plus it's all set up for the COVID-19 things that we're doing so many different webcasts on and whatnot. So I figured this would be a good chance to just video something and put this up on the um, on the Dr. Retina website and see if it doesn't work out. So Daniel's questions are as follows. Uh, do you have any videos or tips on making scleral tunnels? Scleral tunnels that we use for scleral buckles. Um, at Yale, they suture their buckles, but he's interested in creating scleral tunnels and um, what kind of preferences, uh, why would I do scleral tunnels versus suturing a scleral buckle? And so these are all really great questions that I've been asked quite a bit because I do tend to do a lot of scleral tunnels and that's something that I learned during my fellowship down in Miami. And um, the main reason that I do scleral tunnels is because it decreases the amount of hardware that's on the eye. Even though the sutures are very small, sometimes you can get sutures that erodes. Uh, and if you're taking a buckle off, uh, you're going to want to, in most cases, go in and take those sutures out. So you're going to have to open up in all four quadrants versus a tunneled buckle, which is held on by scleral belt loops. Uh, you're able to go in, identify where your sleeve is, cut that buckle, and if you know where your tunnel is, just slip that buckle off if it's something like a 41. I also like it because there's just not the mess of hardware on the eye as you're putting it on. So you don't have um, spaghetti sutures everywhere as you're kind of suturing things in. Some of the disadvantages of scleral tunnels, number one, it doesn't work well in areas of thin sclera. Usually in areas of thin sclera, you're gonna to have to suture. And you don't get the imbrication um, that you would get by spacing your sutures a little more uh, widely uh, than you actual, actually are to uh, attach the buckle. It's simply your imbrication comes from a circumferential kind of squeezing in of the eye wall. Surprising how nice of a contour you can get with the scleral tunnels though um, to just get on a really nice buckle. And you can even incorporate things like a 287 WG uh, and suture those in place and get a really nice broad imbrication. I think tunnels also are really, really um, uh, quick as far as that goes. You can put a um, buckle on much more rapidly in my mind than you can with sutures, although sutures can be fairly efficient as well. And it's just a way that I was taught um, and I really like it. So getting into some of the aspects of getting into scleral tunneling for the first time. So one of the initial things that you're going to need is the appropriate equipment. Uh, and I'll use a 64 blade uh, or a beaver blade for my initial incisions that I'll make. These will each be typically about uh, two and a half to three millimeters long. And I'll oftentimes put those uh, initial vertical incisions uh, about two and a half to three and a half millimeters posterior to the insertion of the rectus muscle. I almost always am tunneling a, a uh, 41 band onto the eye. A 41 band is broader than a 240 band, yet it's not as thick as a 42 band. And so it's kind of a nice compromise. It gives you a really nice broad area uh, that catches a lot of breaks, even if they tend to fall a little more posteriorly on the buckle. Why will I vary it from two and a half to three and a half back and sometimes even four back? If I have a really big eye, and a lot of times when you're taking the conjunctiva down, and you're really starting to look at the uh, sclera, uh, you'll be able to tell if you have a bigger eye. A bigger eye is going to ha tend to have um, a more posterior vitreous insertion, and so you're gonna wanna have that buckle put a little further back in a big eye. Also, if you have an eye that you know has a posterior vitreous base insertion or an eye that has a lot of more posterior pathology, you'll wanna put that tunnel back just a little bit further. If I'm doing kind of a standard routine buckle vitrectomy for a pseudophagic detachment um, that has probably a couple of small pseudophagic peripheral breaks, 
I'll tend to just put that uh, initial tunnel uh, uh, cut two and a half millimeters posterior to the insertion of the rectus muscle. I will make that tunnel length about three millimeters if possible. If you have some thinner sclera, but not blue sclera, you can still tunnel very carefully. But the thinner your sclera is, uh, the wider you're gonna want to make your tunnel. So you wanna space out those two vertical incisions a little bit further because you'll get uh, more strength to hold your buckle on uh, with that tunnel when you've got it a little bit uh, uh, wider so you're incorporating more sclera. I try to make it anywhere from 50 to 70% depth. I don't wanna see a lot of blue when I'm doing it. If I do see that, I'll move over and make a fresh new tunnel as far as that goes. I'll make one tunnel per quadrant. When I'm connecting the two vertical incisions in the eye, what I'll tend to do is use a Castro Viejo scleral dissector. Now, I feel like this piece of equipment, which is a reusable piece of equipment, is absolutely very critical for making good tunnels. My partner, Dr. Blake Eisenhagen, will be able to use a crescent blade. I tried that at first, and the problem with the crescent blade I have is, is that it's sharp not only on the tip, but also on the edges. And the Castro Viejo differs a little bit in that it's sharpest on the tip, but it actually is a little more dull on the edges. And so that way you can really get aggressive going side to side as you kind of wiggle that Castro Viejo scleral dissector through there. And you'll find that um, it'll connect up really, really nicely. Uh, when you're passing the buckle, there's a few tips. Um, I make my tunnels first and then I'll come back and put the buckle on and uh, go beneath the recti muscles and whatnot. Uh, if you don't have thin sclera at the bed of your tunnels, then you can actually start to pass the buckle almost like you're going straight into the eye and it will curve around and come into the eye or come into the tunnel exactly how you want it. And then uh, the key is, is, is with your Nugents or Tennessees to hold the back part of the buckle until you've grabbed the front part and then wiggle it through. You'll really notice that the initial edge of the buckle needs to be kind of cut at an angle so that it almost looks like the front of the Concord um, sloped down so that you have a, a good angle by which you can get that buckle through the tunnel and then pull it through. You can actually squeeze a buckle through a tunnel that's a little bit smaller than your buckle and the scleral will kind of stretch to fit it in as far as that goes. I try not to make too loose of a tunnel because I want that buckle to be held in place pretty nicely as far as that goes. Uh, I'll slide it around um, and then I'll put my sleeve on. There was a question that Daniel had about uh, why I use a, a 270 sleeve versus a 72 sleeve. Honestly, I started using a 270 sleeve because when I was putting buckles on, uh, they ran out of the 72 sleeves. And so I just started using a 270 sleeve for about everything. And it works, it works, it's nice and pliable. And so that's all we really have now is a 270 sleeve. A 72 might have been made, in fact, a 72 was made for a 42 band. So it's a little better for a 41 band just as far as size is concerned. But I've just always used a 270, so it's just by nature. A, a 270 or a 72, either one will work. There's no advantage to using a 270. It was just kind of doing what we had available. Uh, do, another question that Daniel had was, do you always suture down a 106 radial element if it slips under the 41 band? And a 106 is really great uh, for catching uh, more posterior pathology, for giving you a little more posterior kick. The only time I'll suture a 106, and I suture it uniquely, is, is if I have really posterior pathology that I need to catch, and then I'll put a, kind of a vertical mattress suture behind my 41 band, and I'll angle it so that I can actually drag that 106 more posteriorly to get even more posterior imbrication to just catch a tear that may be on the, on the back slope or down slope of the 41 band or something that may fish mouth as far as that goes. Otherwise, when I slide a 106 underneath my 41 and just kind of hook the edge under the 41, um, I leave it unsutured. I just trim the anterior edge so that it's fairly flush with the 41 band. And that'll give me a really nice area of imbrication with a little bit more posterior support and a little posterior kick thanks to that foot plate. But for most of those 106s, I don't suture them at all. I just slide them under there and, and let them go. Um, they tend not to migrate at all because it has that foot plate locking it in place, preventing it from sliding anteriorly. One of my mentors, who's an incredible surgeon, Harry Flynn, uh, used to take a piece of 41 band and he would snip it off and then he would slide it vertically underneath 
the uh, 41 band to try and give a little extra kick in an area. That's a really great technique. I used that for a bit and I found that sometimes that 41 band piece would actually slide out and migrate anteriorly and then we'd have to go in and uh, usually remove it in clinic if it started to present itself under the uh, conjunctiva. And then the final uh, question is, is after the case, will you give the patient a bolus dose, 60 milligrams of oral prednisone to present, po prevent postoperative pain? No, we don't. Um, in fact, we've gotten away uh, from using any kind of steroids or pain medications after scleral buckles. Now on occasion, if you put a really big buckle under someone's um, rectus muscles, they'll have a lot of pain and a lot of swelling. But in actuality, we, we haven't given any IV steroids uh, after buckles. In fact, we don't give any subtenons kinolog. We just give some subconjunctival uh, dexamethasone. And uh, patients can manage their pain and swelling with uh, postoperative Tylenol. We don't give uh, pain medications at all for post-op buckle patients. So it works out really well from our standpoint, decreases uh, narcotic prescriptions that go out. In fact, I haven't written a narcotic prescription for any post-operative patient uh, aside from hemorrhagic choroidals uh, in over a year. So the key with post-operative swelling and pain is positioning. If you keep these patients face down, they will have a lot of swelling, they'll have a lot of pressure and things such as that. But if you keep them on the opposite side down or you're able at all to keep them upright in any way, shape, or form, uh, they'll have less dependent edema, they'll have less uh, chemosis, less swelling, and less pressure. And they seem to do well with the discomfort side of things. So that's kind of some thoughts, Daniel, on um, scleral tunnels. If you start to do them, and I would encourage people to try doing scleral tunnels, I think you'll love them, actually. Um, if you, uh, are on, um, the way we do buckles and the way we manage buckles. Thanks for the email. I look forward to meeting you at a meeting as well as anybody else who watches. Uh, good luck and stay healthy with COVID-19. Thanks.